We are live from Bloomberg's World Headquarters in Midtown Manhattan. I'm Matt Miller. And I'm Kriti Gupta stepping in for Kaylee Lines. Welcome to Bloomberg Crypto. A look at the people, transactions, and technology shaping the world of decentralized finance. Coming up, Bitcoin may be hinting at a bottom. Whether or not we are really seeing a floor, though, is up for debate. Noelle Atchison of Genesis Trading weighs in. And after the NFT hype, data shows that the market's getting hit just as hard as the rest of crypto. We'll discuss with NFT collector Sergio Silva of Fireblocks. Plus, more from our exclusive interview with Sam Bankman Fried. The billionaire is eyeing more acquisitions as he solidifies his massive influence in the industry. Well, that's all ahead. But let's check out the markets here because you are seeing, of course, this risk off dynamic in the broader macro markets. The S&P 500 down, Bitcoin down as well as that risk sentiment indicator. You can really see the pain here, but put this into a volatility adjusted context. Bitcoin down about 4% on an average day. To see it only down 1%, perhaps suggests a little bit of a turnaround in sentiment. Is that something that perhaps the stock side is anticipating? You can see that at least when it comes to Coinbase, the digital exchange for cryptocurrencies down or up, excuse me, about 3.2%. It's interesting that's coming in line with some of this kind of defensive tech move, essentially the big tech that led you to those record highs. Once again, they're the ones that are outperforming in today's trade. MicroStrategy as well, the investor, of course, in Bitcoin up about 6%, also higher on the day. But even the miners, Riot Blockchain, for example, up about 5.1%, Matt. It's interesting to see that divergence. Does Bitcoin catch up to what the stock market is pricing in? Yeah, absolutely. And it really puts it into perspective to look at the drop that we've seen over the last quarter in Bitcoin. Bitcoin in percentage terms. It's the biggest drop that we've seen in those terms um, since all the way back to Q3 in 2011. But if you look at it in terms of absolute numbers, Bitcoin fell from $45,000 at the end of March of this year to about $18,000. Back in 2011, the huge drop was from $15 down to $6. So I think that says a lot about how far we've come. This market turmoil nonetheless has produced opportunities for companies like like FTX to swoop in and buy assets on the cheap. Sam Bankman Freed spoke exclusively with Bloomberg. First of all, I'm way more excited to bail out customers than shareholders. We're in a place where I think we could make a significant um, you know, acquisition to the extent that that fit the business and, and to the extent that, that there is alignment on it. If we don't buy, we will build. And that's what we are gearing up to do is to build out everything that we need internally. This is more uh, you know, identifying potential opportunities, um, if there are any, uh, for us to uh, you know, uh, grow you know, further and faster. And obviously, you know, the changing uh, valuations do play a real role. Um, in, in our decision making here. I think basically that there are some uh, businesses that uh, I think have a really bright future uh, in front of them. I think others were probably just always overhyped and you know never never made a ton of sense and were mostly froth. We are trying to find who were the responsible players who were building out you know a good business, you know had a sustainable model. Now, obviously, we'll take a look at anything, right? And 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 there might come along a really compelling opportunity. We're always looking at possibilities. So the fallout from recent crypto chaos continues. Vault, the Singapore-based crypto lender, announced a freeze on client withdrawals and says it has signed a tentative agreement to be acquired now by rival Nexo. Vault has become the latest among several crypto lenders to resort to emergency measures in order to stay afloat. Joining us now is Noel Atchison, head of market insights at Genesis Trading. Noel, thank you as always for joining us. Let's start big picture here. You have a background in capital markets. It's involved isn't the first to send the sort of message. You had Celsius, you had Three Arrows Capital as well. How much of this move that you're seeing, this crunch, I should say, is a result of the macro factors? Kind of connect the dots for us, if you will. That's a great question, Kriti. And hi, Matt. Thank you both so much for having me. I do have to say that everything I say is my opinion, not that of my employer. And of course, nothing I say is investment advice. But going back to your question, Kriti, it, Kriti, it is very much uh, in line with the macro sentiment. I mean, we keep we paying attention also to what's happening with many of the fintech companies, many of the larger consumer companies as well. Layoffs are a thing across the entire market, not just in crypto. And the tension that we've been seeing from liquidity being withdrawn on all fronts is starting to take its toll. That said, we are also seeing the correlation between Bitcoin and the S&P 500 come down a lot. In 60 basis, it's down about 0.45, which is almost half where it was 
at the beginning of May. This highlights the crypto specific nature of the slump that we've seen in our particular market versus the broader market. Not exactly mm. the kind of decoupling we were hoping for, but it is a reminder that crypto does have distinct narratives and this will bring in new types of investors when no sentiment turns. Noel, I wonder about the new investors it can bring in or new people who are going to want to um, you know, leave Wall Street for crypto as you did, as a number of the kind of superstars of the industry have. Is that going to continue with this crash in prices or does it dissuade people from taking that leap? That's a wonderful question, Matt. No, it does not dissuade people who are interested in the future of markets. We are seeing quality candidates. This does one thing. It does filter out those that actually do believe in the reforming potential of this industry and not just in it for the money. So it's good for the industry in terms of hiring on that respect. And the builders are going to continue to build. The Genesis, we're continuing to build. Many market participants, as you just saw earlier, are continuing to do so as well. Their markets are much more interesting, a lot less fun than bull markets, but they're more interesting because that's when real work does get done. And this bear market is so different from the last one. We have just last week passed in the world's third largest economic bloc, a comprehensive uh, crypto framework, not passed, but approved the terms of. We have the president of the United States issuing an executive order that was much more supportive than many of us thought and asking for more exploration. The institutional involvement is of an orders of magnitude degrees higher than it was last bear market. So it's very, very different. And it is precisely mm. all of that building that is going to bring in the new types of investors that are going to drive the next bull market. Bull markets are always driven by new investors coming in. One of the things I've never understood, Noel, is I can get and seemingly everyone is convinced uh, about the use, use case for blockchain and that it um, it's incredibly um, Gear, well geared towards building a lot of things. You can put contracts on there. You can um, stake property rights with it. But why do you need to own the token or tokens, plural? Why can't you just have one and be done? Experimentation with economic incentives. That's one of the things I'm personally most excited about is we've never before, Matt, been able to experiment with new economic principles and incentives in real time at scale before. And even if most of these aren't going to work, just what we learn, I mean, that is one of the things that makes me extremely bullish. I was chuckling when you were asking the question because I do remember just before the 2018 crash how excited we were about lettuce on the blockchain, TV on the blockchain, all sorts of things on the blockchain. We're not seeing that this time. NFTs perhaps replaced a lot of that. And I don't think any of us are going to claim that NFTs are totally useless. They are entirely new framework that we have yet to fully explore. But experimentation, the innovation, permissionless, uh, rapid, agile, at scale, in real time. That just on the technology point of view is one of the most compelling reasons to learn about this industry. But that technology, Noel, is also something that you could say is boasted in a digital euro, a digital yuan as well, potentially a digital dollar if the United States ever gets there. If those kind of mechanisms or those tools are ultimately created and have that regulation and backing from the central banks around the world, what is the base case to hop into your bitcoins, your ethereums, any other cryptocurrencies? Different use cases. I mean, first of all, Bitcoin is truly decentralized. And I think a few people are going to argue that uh, central bank digital currencies are going to be truly decentralized. There's all sorts of use cases that can be layered on top of decentralization, different, de different degrees of decentralization as well. But what I'm most excited about, Kriti, is when we all have to have a digital wallet on our phones because we are all using central bank mandated digital currencies, then again, just the use cases and the opportunities that can be layered on top of that for crypto based assets with different functionalities. That's very exciting. That is a user adoption uh, step change. In terms of uh, Bitcoin being truly decentralized, um, how do you feel about regulation? Is that a good thing for the industry or a bad thing? Because around about the time that Russia invaded Ukraine, um, there were a lot of reports of the governments telling, um, telling exchanges not to allow certain people to access their money, their property. 
Regulation always comes with trade-offs. Genesis is an institutional facing prime broker. So regulation is something we've been keeping a close eye on. And we know that the clients that we talk to, the institutions, the large investors, they're comfortable with regulation. Let's face it, nobody wants to put the reputational risk on the line when it comes to dealing in unregulated assets. So we firmly believe it'll be a good thing for the industry when it happens. And a huge change is you don't hear any of the major economic powers talk about banning crypto anymore. It's all about how can we cooperate? How can we work with the builders to protect the investors and to make sure that this industry grows in a responsible fashion? We believe that this is a net positive for the industry. Obviously, much innovation will, many innovators will perhaps have a problem with that, but that will continue anyways. The institutional yep. investors that yep. we talk to will be happy. With hey, that. awesome to have this conversation. I have so many more questions that I might just call you after the show because <laughs> uh, it's great to get your insight here. Noel, thanks so much for joining us. Noel Atchison there of Genesis Trading. Coming up, we're going to discuss the risks and opportunities in the NFT market with collector Sergio Silva of Fireblocks. And more from Bloomberg's exclusive interview with billionaire Sam Bankman Fried. He's looking at mergers and acquisitions in the middle of this crypto winter. And to access all the latest data and news on crypto, check out CRYP Go on the terminal. This is Bloomberg. Gupta with Matt Miller. Kaylee Lines is off today. The market for non-fungible tokens has been spiraling downward. NFT sales plunged in June to below the $1 billion mark. And the JPG NFT index, which tracks a handful of blue chip NFT projects, is down by more than 70% since its inception in April. Sergio Silva, an NFT collector and a sales director at Firebox, joins us now. Sergio, thank you, as always, for joining us. I have to say, it's pretty exciting because your background here isn't just in NFTs. You do a lot more than that. Your career has been uh, far, far more macro, I would say. But I have to ask, what drew you, just for our audience to understand, to NFTs to begin with? I knew you when NFTs were just starting out, and you were the only guy in the room who said, this is something that's going to go big. Well, thank you for having me. Um, yeah, I was a sales trader at Barclays. I spent 12 years on sales desk across the street. And I was bored one day doing research for my morning note. And I had seen somebody mention on one of the crypto newsletters that a collector had paid over $100,000 for something called a CryptoPunk. And I immediately took that and wrote a note saying how that was ridiculous. And it just showed that the dollar was losing its value and people were losing their mind buying JPEGs. Uh, little did I know that in my research, I just kind of like fell down the rabbit hole, went to the CryptoPunks Discord community, fell in love with it, got you know, red-pilled as they say and saw the value in owning some of these unique digital assets. Well, in the setup that we had to you, we talked about how they've lost 70% of their value when we're looking at that JP Morgan index. One, why do you think that's happening? And two, what turns it around? Sure, so a lot of stuff has lost value over the last 12 months, not just NFTs or crypto. You look at tech stocks, you look at even housings already, you know, weakening a little bit. So I think a lot of that loss in value comes from you know, just general macro factors. When it comes to you know, NFTs and the tokens that everybody is excited about, you have two components, um, one being the crypto itself, and second, the fact that these tokens are 24-7 tradable across the world obviously react very, very differently than traditional assets. Um, and so, yeah, they just, they're high beta place. I just want to break in here with some news that's completely unrelated, although you may want to Somebody may want to sell the NFT of Rishi Sunak's re resignation. Um, we are seeing that Rishi Sunak, uh, the chancellor in the UK, is going to resign. He's stepping down as chancellor. This is not the only resignation from Boris Johnson's government, because just minutes ago, we saw that Sajid Javid is going to resign as Secretary of State for Health as well. So a couple of uh, key members, certainly one incredibly important member to Boris Johnson's government, and um, one who has been an important member of Boris Johnson's government is, are, are resigning. Um, and we'll continue to follow this story for you. But it brings up an interesting point um, surrounding NFTs, um, Sergio, that I have never really been clear on. Who has the rights to sell these kind of things? And, you know, when I see an NFT of LeBron's dunk or an NFT of the Pulp Fiction script, or if I make an NFT, 
guarantee of Rishi Sunak's um, uh, resignation as chancellor. How do I have the right to sell that? I think that's actually the beauty of NFTs in that given the blockchain's characteristics, that it's public, you can see the provenance of the tokens. And so if you own the IP or you create an IP for NFTs, then you can sell it, right? And as we go through time in 200 years, whoever has that token then can trace it back on the blockchain to its genesis to when it was minted and see, okay, well, is this something where the creator so had the IP rights? So it's a lot like first come, first serve though, right? Not really, because would you value something, like a picture of LeBron that somebody just mints on the blockchain that really doesn't come from him or his team, it's not licensed. Would you value that? Not really. But if it's something where LeBron sells it himself, and on top of that, and really what the story, what's happening with NFTs today is that you're able to build communities and deliver value through those tokens. So if instead LeBron sells you an NFT and that gives you access to his Discord, to communications, to discounted tickets and merch, then that's really where the NFT unlock comes about. All right, Sergio, it's been great having you on the program. Thanks so much for joining us. We've got to get back to this breaking news, but Sergio Silva there of Fireblocks giving us some really fascinating insight. I want to get to what's going on in the UK because Rishi, Rishi Sunak has been such an important, if controversial, member of Boris Johnson's government as Chancellor. Joe Mays, the Bloomberg UK government reporter, joins us now to tell us exactly what's happening. Joe? So, yeah, as you say, in the last few moments, the Chancellor, Rishi Sunak, has dramatically resigned from Boris Johnson's government, joining Health Secretary Sajid Javid, who himself resigned a few moments before. And effectively, this feels like the end of the Boris Johnson administration. You can't overstate the importance of losing two of your biggest cabinet members uh, and the manner in which they've done so, Rishi Sunak, in his resignation letter, saying that you know, the public expects government to be conducted properly, competently, seriously, and he thinks those are principles worth fighting for, and that's why he is resigning. He also cites differences of Johnson over the economy. I mean, throughout today, the, the talk in Westminster has been it will take a cabinet push to get rid of Boris Johnson, and that's what we're seeing right now. And this all comes after that anger over his handling of the case of Christopher Pincher, the former deputy chief whip who resigned last week over those allegations of groping. And uh, it's the way the prime minister's handled that allegation has angered so many uh, and attempted to cover up effectively. So, yeah, we're now seeing uh, a cabinet kind of cabinet resignations coming through now. And it's a case of who's next. Joe, put this into some context for us, because we know that this is coming in the context of the UK dealing with a lot of economic pressures, a cost of living crisis on their own at a time when the government has been talking about subsidies to just general Brits to talk about dealing with food inflation, dealing with energy inflation. How does the changes in the government affect moves like that? Yeah, and that's why this resignation by the Chancellor is so dramatic. I mean, in his resignation letter, he says, look, I know we are trying to recover from the pandemic. I know the war in Ukraine is ongoing. I know we're trying to deal with this cost of crisis, but I still feel like I have to resign given how upset I am with the kind of the conduct of you as Prime Minister. I mean, this does throw, you know, UK's approach to the economy in, into turmoil, at least in the short term. We now have, you know, the prospect of the Prime Minister perhaps facing a leadership contest, perhaps uh, a new Conservative leader not before long. So it, it throws things into disarray. This government is now in yeah. total disarray, and, uh, and we have to see who's going to resign next. I mean, we've already seen, um, from the financial markets perspective, a little bit of disarray here today, right? Joe, we had the pound falling below 119, and this isn't um, something that's solely a U.K. problem. The euro fell below 103. But... I have spoken with analysts and investors today who have said, you know, the UK is having the same problems as the rest of Europe in terms of inflation and a slowdown in growth. But adding Brexit to that is just really insult to injury. And, and Brexit is still biting six years later. Yes, it certainly is. And that, that structural shift of the UK being outside the EU single market and customs union has created new trade barriers that companies in the UK have to deal with, and that's adding to that inflationary pressure. We know that the inability to attract new labor is also hurting the ability of companies to hire workers, which in turn pushing up prices. So, yes, as you say, it's that added uh, kind of uh, burden on the UK economy, which, which is it's just translating into that lack of confidence. Joe, I guess the key question here is, as you watch some of his most important ministers step down, is this the end for Boris Johnson? Does he have to go? 
It, it, it feels like it. I mean, these were... It, 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 the wider parliamentary Conservative Party had already been expressing lots of concern about Boris Johnson. They you know, 40% voted against him, the confidence vote last month. But it was the Cabinet that was sticking with him. But now if the Cabinet's not with him, if his top ministers are leaving too, there's really kind of... There's no one left when it comes to supporting the Conservative Party. And without supporting the Conservative Party, you cannot be Conservative Prime Minister. And that's where we now stand. Joe, it wasn't too long ago that Boris Johnson was actually facing a, a no-confidence vote. I'm curious, does he face one again? What does the timeline look like from here? So what would have to happen is there would have to be a change to the rules in the Conservative Party to allow another leadership contest, because as it stands currently, you'd have to be a year between leadership votes. But there are elections coming up to the committee that decides those rules, so there could be a, an anti-Boris majority which comes in to change those rules. But I think actually the more likely step at this point is Boris himself having to step down, uh, just seeing that the right thing's on the wall here, and therefore that will be how the change in leadership happens. He might try and you know, fight on, but at this point his dignity and, and his kind of political credibility credibility and legacy is in danger if he were to try to do so. So don't be surprised if the next step is Boris himself, knowing that the time is up. Does, does he have any support left in the UK? I mean, aside from Queen Elizabeth, um, it seems like everyone's dissenting here. Are there, are, are there any um, allies left for him in government? Well, two of his cabinet ministers have resigned, which still leaves all the others who are, as we speak, in post. But I, I'd be surprised if that's still the case come the end of this evening. So he does still have some loyalty in the party, but not enough at this point to, 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 to survive in post, or at least so it feels right now. Um, I mean, Boris Johnson has always thought that the electorate likes him more than his own MPs do. Um, but even that's been tested recently with poor polling and defeats in by-elections uh, heavily last month. So, yeah, I mean, it feels like the game is increasingly up. Who, who, who can replace him at this point? I mean, um, does, does Dominic Robb, if he resigns, take over? Do you have uh, challenges from people like Liz Truss? Yeah, so Dominic Robb is the current Deputy Prime Minister, and you'd expect him to, yeah, perhaps fill in as like an interim caretaker while there is a contest for a new leader. But then, you, yeah, you're right to say there are lots of potential candidates. You could be the next Prime Minister. You talk about Liz Truss, obviously Rishi Sunak himself, who's just resigned. He might consider himself a contender. Oh, and then you have people on the back benches, Tom Tugendat. You have people like... Um, Nadine Zahawi, currently in the cabinet, Jeremy Hunt, who ran against Johnson last time. You know, there's a large cast of characters who would fancy their chances. And that's where thoughts will be turning now. Thoughts will be turning to, you know, who will be the next next person. And in that cast of, of potential candidates, also we should point out that for anyone who's not familiar with UK politics here, the Queen has to agree with whoever uh, is in, in Boris Johnson's seat. But I have to ask, in that cast of characters that you just mentioned, of candidates, I should say, which is perhaps the most likely or more friendly when it comes to Brexit policies that have been at play right now? We know the UK and the EU still at odds in terms of how this is all going to play out. Yeah, I think pretty much all of those people I have mentioned would never countenance a strongly pro-EU position in terms of reversing Brexit. That's not on the cards. But there's certainly more centrist conservatives among that group. Take a Jeremy Hunt, for example. Take a Tom Tugendat, who you'd expect on the Northern Ireland Protocol negotiation might look to be more constructive with the EU, not take such a kind of belligerent approach in those talks. So perhaps we might be moving towards that if the party does go for a, uh, a more kind of centrist conservative candidate. So, yeah, yeah I think that, that's, that's probably a prospect. Joe, thanks so much for joining us. Pleasure having you on this breaking news. I'm sure you got to get back to your desk and start banging out stories. Joe Mays there, Bloomberg's uh, UK politics editor. Um, we're going to continue to cover this story. Rishi Sunak, again, resigning as US, uh, UK uh, Chancellor Critty. We saw uh, just moments uh, before that another resignation and uh, all of this happening while Boris Johnson is speaking. Right. And I think what's interesting here is the market reaction. You didn't see a ton of movement simply on the headlines themselves and on the news themselves. But remember, we're coming into a context where sterling weakness has been the trade of the day, the name of the day, a lot of that coming off of the ripple effects of the euro. Even if you look at uh, pound or the cable rate pound against the dollar, you're seeing some weakness. But pound against the euro, even that hasn't been moving a ton as well. So, of course, we're going to keep you apprised of all the market moves coming off of these headlines as we see what does this mean for Boris Johnson's future? What does this mean for perhaps the future of, of the United Kingdom? Ex absolutely. Guy Johnson uh, rushing back to set to cover this breaking story. We'll give you all the details you need to know as well as all of the market reaction. This is Bloomberg.